Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is the introduction. Romanticism, Messianism, and Marxism in Walter Benjamin's Philosophy of History. Walter Benjamin is an author unlike any other. His fragmentary, unfinished, at times hermetic, often anachronistic, and yet nonetheless always contemporary work occupies a singular, even unique place in the intellectual and political panorama of the 20th century. Was he primarily, as Hannah Arendt claimed, a literary critique, an homme de lettres, not a philosopher? I am more inclined to agree with Gershom Scholem that, even when writing about art or literature, he was a philosopher. Adorno's point of view is close to Scholem's, as he explains in an unpublished letter to Hannah Arendt. For me, what defines Benjamin's significance for my own intellectual existence is axiomatic, the essence of his thought as philosophical thought. I have never been able to see his stuff from another perspective, just how far it distances itself from every traditional conception of philosophy is something I am aware of, of course. Benjamin's readers, particularly in France, have been concerned mainly with the aesthetic side of his work and have inclined towards regarding him first and foremost as a historian of culture. Now, without neglecting that aspect of his work, he must acknowledge the far wider scope of his thought, which aims to achieve no less than a new understanding of human history. His writings on art and literature can be understood only in relation to this overall vision that illuminates them from within. His thinking forms a whole in which art, history, culture, politics, literature, and theology are inseparable. We usually classify the various philosophies of history by their progressive or conservative, revolutionary, or nostalgic character. Walter Benjamin does not fit into these classifications. He is a revolutionary critic of the philosophy of progress, a Marxist opponent of progressivism, a nostalgic who dreams of the future, a romantic advocate of materialism. He is, in every sense of the word, unclassifiable. Adorno rightfully defined him as a thinker, standing apart from all tendencies, and his work presents itself, in fact, as a kind of erratic block in the margins of the main schools of contemporary philosophy. It is futile, then, to attempt to recruit him into one of the other of the two main camps contending for hegemony on the stage. He should we say, or should we say the market, of ideas, modernism and postmodernism. Jurgen Habermas seems to hesitate after condemning Benjamin's anti-evolutionism in his article of 1966 as contrary to historical materialism. He asserts in his The Philosophical Discourse of Modernity that Benjamin's polemic against the socio-evolutionary leveling off of historical materialism is directed against the degeneration of modernity's consciousness of time and aims therefore at renewing that consciousness. But he does not, he does not succeed in integrating into his philosophical discourse of modernity the central Benjaminian concepts, such as the now time, that authentic instant that interrupts the continuum of history, which seems to him to be manifestly inspired by a mixture of surrealist experiences and motifs from Jewish mysticism. It would be an equally impossible task to transform Benjamin into a postmodernist avant la lettre. His delegitimation of the grand narrative of Western modernity, his deconstruction of the discourse of progress, and his plea for historical discontinuity are immeasurably far removed from the postmodernist's detached gaze on current society, which is presented as, as a world where grand narratives have finally been consigned to the past and replaced by flexible, agonistic language games. Benjamin's conception of history is not postmodern, firstly because, far from beyond, being beyond all narratives, supposing that such a thing were possible, 
it constitutes a heterodox form of the narrative of emancipation, taking its inspiration from Marxist and messianic sources. It uses nostalgia for the past as a revolutionary method for the critique of the present. His thought is therefore neither modern in Habermas's sense, nor postmodern, as Leotard understands the term, but consists rather in a modern critique of capitalist industrial modernity, inspired by pre-capitalist cultural and historical references. Among the attempts at interpreting his work, there is one that seems to me particularly questionable, the approach that believes he can be placed in the same philosophical camp as Martin Heidegger. In her touching essay of the 1960s, Hannah Arendt unfortunately contributed to this confusion, asserting against all the evidence that without realizing it, Benjamin actually had more in common with Heidegger than he did with the dialectical subtleties of his Marxist friends. However, Benjamin made crystal clear his feelings of hostility towards the author of Sein und Zeit long before Heidegger revealed his allegiance to the Third Reich. In a letter to Shalom dated January 20th, 1930, he speaks of the shock of the confrontation between our two very different ways of looking at history. And shortly afterwards, on April 25th, he writes to his friend about a project for a critical reading with Brecht, in which they were planning to annihilate Heidegger. In the Arcades project, he mentions one of the main points of his critique. Heidegger seeks in vain to rescue history for phenomenology abstractly through histori historicity. When in 1938, International or International Literature, a Moscow-based Stalinist publication, presented him on the strength of a passage from his article on Goethe's oh fuck, Walver von Schaften <laughs> from 1922 as a follower of Heidegger. He could not help but comment in a letter to Gretel Adorno that this publication is quite wretched. One may admittedly compare the two authors' conceptions of historical time to identify points of affinity. The theme of eschatology, the Heideggerian conception of authentic temporality, and the openness of the past. If one takes the view, as Lucien Goldman does, that Lucas's history and class consciousness was one of the hidden sources of being and time, one might suppose that Benjamin and Heidegger both drew inspiration from the same work. However, starting out from a set of common questions, the two thinkers diverge radically. It seems clear to me that Benjamin was not a follower of Heidegger, not simply because he denies it categorically, but for the good reason that his critical conception of temporality was already defined to all intents and purposes during the years 1915 to 25, long before the publication of Sein und Zeit in 1927. Walter Benjamin's Theses on the Concept of History, published in 1940, constitutes one of the most important philosophical and political texts of the 20th century. In revolutionary thought, it is perhaps the most significant document since Marx's Theses on Feuerbach. It is an enigmatic, elusive, even sibylline text its hermeticism studded with images, allegories, and illustrations, strewn with strange paradoxes and shot through with dazzling insights. If we are to be able to interpret this document, it is, I believe, indispensable to situate it within the development of Benjamin's work. Let us attempt to identify, in the movement of his thought, the moments that prepare or prefigure the text of 1940. Benjamin's philosophy of history draws on three very different sources, German Romanticism, Jewish Messianism, and Marxism. And we are not looking at a combinatorial or an eclectic synthesis of these three, apparently incompatible perspectives, but at the invention of a new and profoundly original conception on the basis of all of them. His approach cannot be explained by some particular influence, the different schools of thought, the various authors he cites in his friends' writings, are so many materials from which he builds a construction of his own, 
elements with which he effects an alchemical fusion to produce philosopher's gold. The expression philosophy of history may be misleading here. There is no philosophical system in Benjamin's writings. All his thinking takes the form of essays or fragments, if not indeed of quotation, pure and simple. The passages wrenched from their context being made to serve his own approach. Any attempt at systematizing this mode of thinking poetically is then problematical and uncertain. The brief remarks that follow merely offer a number of avenues for research. In the literature on Benjamin, one often finds two symmetrical errors that should, I think, be avoided at all costs. The first consists in splitting off the idealist theological work of his youth from the materialist revolutionary work of his maturity by effecting a quasi-surgical epistemological break between the two. Hmm, sounds familiar. The second, by contrast, sees his work as a homogeneous whole and takes no account whatever of the profound upheaval occasioned in the mid-1920s by his discovery of Marxism. In order to understand the movement of his thought, we have then to take account simultaneously of the continuity of certain essential themes and the various breaks and turning points that mark his intellectual and political traje trajectory. Let us take as our starting point the romantic moment, which is at the center of the preoccupations of the young Benjamin. To grasp the full scope of this, we have perhaps to remember that romanticism is not just a literary, and artistic school of the early 19th century. It is a true vision of the world, a style of thinking, a structure of sensibility that manifests itself in all spheres of cultural life, from Rousseau and novelists to the surrealists and beyond. One might define the romantic Walton Shung Wal as a cultural critique of modern capitalist civilization in the name of pre-modern pre-capitalist values, <clears throat> a critique or protest that bears upon aspects which are felt to be unbearable and degrading, the quantification and mechanization of life, the reification of social relations, the dissolution of the community, and the disenchantment of the world. Its nostalgia for the past does not mean it is necessarily retrograde. The romantic view of the world may assume both reactionary and revolutionary forms. For revolutionary romanticism, the aim is not a return to the past, but a detour through the past on the way to a utopian future. In the late 19th century Germany, romanticism, sometimes referred to as neo-romanticism, was one of the dominant cultural forms in both literature and the human sciences. It expresses itself through multiple attempts at re-enchanting the world, in which the return of the religious element plays a preeminent role. Benjamin's relation to Romanticism is not then expressed solely either through his interest in the fru-romantic, fru, fru in particular Schlegel and novelists, or in such late Romantic figures as E.T.A. Hoffman, Franz von Bader, Franz Joseph Molitor and Johann Jacob Bakofen, or alternatively in Baudelaire and the Surrealists, but through the whole range of his aesthetic, theological, and historiosophical ideas. Moreover, these three spheres are so closely connected in Benjamin that it is difficult to dissociate them without destroying what constitutes the singularity of his thinking. And indeed, one of Benjamin's first articles, published in 1913, was entitled Romantic. It calls for the birth of a new Romanticism, proclaiming that the Romantic will to beauty, the Romantic will to truth, and the, rom and the Romantic will to action are the insurpassable achievements of modern culture. This virtually inaugural text attests both to Benjamin's deep attachment to the Romantic tradition conceived as art, knowledge, and praxis, and to a desire for a renewal. Another narrative from the same period, the dialogue on the religiosity of the present, also reveals the young Benjamin's fascination for this culture. We have had romanticism and we owe to it the powerful insight into the nocturnal side of the natural, but we live as though romanticism had never existed. 
The text also touches on the neo-romantic longing for a new religion and a new socialism, whose prophets are Tolstoy, Nietzsche, and Strindberg. This social religion is said to be opposed to the current conceptions of the social sphere, which reduce it to a matter of civilization, like electric light. The dialogue here takes up several aspects of the romantic critique of modernity, the transformation of human beings into work machines, the, de the degradation of work into mere technique, the hope-sapping subjection of persons to the social mechanism, the replacement of the heroic, revolutionary efforts of the past by the pitiful, crab-like march of evolution and progress. This last remark already shows us the twist Benjamin imparts to the Romantic tradition. The attack on the ideology of progress is not made in the name of backward-looking conservatism, but of revolution. We find this subversive inflection again in his lecture on the life of students. A key document which seems to gather into a single beam of light all the ideas that will stay with him throughout his life. According to Benjamin, the real questions facing society are not limited technical philosophical matters, but the great metaphysical questions of Plato and Spinoza, the Romantics and Nietzsche. Among these metaphysical questions, that of historical temporality is essential. The remarks that open the essay provide a striking foretaste of his messianic philosophy of history. There's a view of history that puts its faith in the infinite extent of time and thus concerns itself only with the speed or lack of it with which people and epochs advance along the path of progress. This corresponds to a certain absence of coherence and rigor in the demands it makes on the present. The following remarks in contrast delineate a particular condition in which history appears to be concentrated in a single focal point, like those that have traditionally been found in the utopian images of the philosophers. The elements of the ultimate condition do not manifest themselves as formless progressive tendencies but are deeply rooted in every present, in the form of the most endangered, excoriated, and ridiculed ideas and products of the creative mind. This condition cannot be captured in terms of the pragmatic description of details. Rather, the task is to grasp its metaphysical structure, as with the messianic domain or the idea of the French Revolution. Utopian, messianic, or revolutionary images against formless progressive tendencies posed here in a nutshell are the terms of the debate Benjamin will continue to conduct throughout his life. Messianism is, in Benjamin's view, at the heart of the romantic conception of time and history. In the introduction to his doctoral thesis, The Concept of Criticism in German Romanticism, he stresses the idea that the historic essence of Romanticism is to be sought in Romantic Messianism. He discovers this dimension particularly in the writings of Schlegel and novelists, and quotes, among others, this remarkable passage from the young Friedrich Schlegel. The revolutionary desire to realize the kingdom of God on earth is the inception of modern history. We come back here to the metaphysical question of historical temporality. Benjamin ranges the qualitative conception of infinite time, which derives from romantic messianism, and for which the life of humanity is a process of accomplishment, and not merely of becoming, against the infinitely empty time, characteristic of the modern ideology of progress. One cannot but note the striking similarity between this passage, which seems to have escaped the attention of the commentators, and the 1940 theses on the concept of history. What is the relationship between the two utopian images, the, messi the messianic kingdom and revolution? Without directly answering this question, Benjamin addresses it in a text unpublished in his lifetime, which probably dates from 1921 to 1922 the so-called theological-political fragment. Initially, he seems radically to distinguish the sphere of historical becoming from that of the Messiah. Nothing that is historical can relate itself from its own ground to anything messianic. 
Immediately thereafter, however, he throws a dialectical bridge across this apparently unbridgeable abyss. A fragile gangway that seems directly inspired by certain paragraphs in Franz Rosenzweig's The Star of Redemption, a book Benjamin held in the highest esteem. The dynamics of the secular order, which he defines as the, as the quest of free humanity for happiness, to be compared with Rosenzweig's great works of liberation, may promote the coming of the me messianic kingdom. If Benjamin's formulation is less explicit than Rosenzweig's, for whom emancipatory acts are the necessary condition for the advent of the kingdom of God, the procedure is the same, seeking to establish a mediation between the liberatory, historic, secular struggles of human beings and the fulfillment of the messianic promise. How will this messianic, utopian, and romantic ferment articulate itself with historical materialism? It was from 1924 onwards when he read Lucas's History in Class Consciousness and discovered communism through the eyes of Astra Lachis that Marxism began to become a key element in his conception of history. In 1929, Benjamin was still referring to Lucas's essay as one of the few books that remained lively and contemporary. The most finished philosophical work of Marxist literature, its singularity lies in the assurance with which it has grasped, on the one hand, the critical situation of the class struggle and the critical situation of philosophy, and on the other, revolution, now concretely due as the absolute precondition, if not indeed the absolute fulfillment and completion of theoretical knowledge. This text shows the aspect of Marxism that most interests Benjamin, and which will enable us to cast new light on his vision of the historical process, class struggle. But historical materialism will not supplant his romantically and messianically inspired anti-progressive intuitions. It will articulate itself with them, thus acquiring a critical quality that marks it off radically from the then dominant official Marxism. By his critical attitude to the ideology of progress, Benjamin, in fact, occupies a peculiar, unique position in Marxist thinking and in the European left in the interwar years. This articulation first emerges in One Way Street, written between 1923 and 1926, where we find under the heading Fire Alarm, this historical premonition of the threats posed by progress. If the overthrow of the bourgeoisie by the proletariat is not completed by an almost calculable moment in economic and technical development, a moment signaled by inflation and poison gas warfare, all is lost. Before the spark reaches the dynamite, the lighted fuse must be cut. Contrary to vulgar evolutionary Marxism, which is admittedly able to point to sources in some of the writings of Marx and Engels themselves, Benjamin does not conceive revolution as the natural or inevitable, inevitable outcome of economic and technical progress, or of the contradiction between the forces and relations of production, but as the interruption of a process of historical evolution leading to catastrophe. It is because he perceives this catastrophic danger that he speaks up in his 1929 article on surrealism for pessimism, for revolutionary pessimism that has nothing to do with fatalistic resignation and even less with the conservative reactionary pre-fascist German culture pessimismus of Carl Schmitt, Oswald Spengler, or Moller van den Bruck. Benjamin's pessimism is in the service of the oppressed classes. His preoccupation is not with the decline of the elites or the nation, but with the threats the technical and economic progress fostered by capitalism pose for humanity. Nothing seems more derisory to Benjamin than the optimism of the bourgeois parties and social democracy, whose political program is merely a bad poem on springtime. Against this unprincipled, dilettantish optimism, Inspired by the ideology of linear progress, he discovers in pessimism the point of effective convergence between surrealism 
and communism. Needless to say, this is not a contemplative sentiment, but an active, organized, practical pessimism directed entirely at preventing the onset of disaster by all possible means. One wonders what the concept of pessimism applied to the communists might possibly be referring to. Is not their doctrine in 1929 celebrating the triumphs of the building of socialism in the USSR and the imminent fall of capitalism precisely a fine example of the optimistic illusion? In fact, Benjamin borrowed the concept of the organization of pessimism from a work he described as excellent, La Révolution et les Intellectuels, from 1928, by the dissident communist Pierre Neville. Neville, a member of the Surrealist group, he had been one of the editors of the journal La, Re La Révolution Surrealiste had at that point decided to commit himself to the French Communist Party and sought to persuade his friends to do the same. Now, for Neville, the pessimism that constitutes the source of Marx's revolutionary method is the only way of escaping the mediocrity and disappointment of an age of compromise, rejecting the crude optimism of a Herbert Spencer, whom he fondly describes as a monstrously shriveled brain, or an Anatoly France, whose loathsome jokes he detests. He concludes, we must organize pessimism. The organization of pessimism is the only slogan that will prevent us from withering away. We scarcely need add that this passionate defense of pessimism was far from representative of the political culture of French communism in this period. In fact, Pierre Neville was soon to be expelled from the party the logic of his anti-optimism would lead him into the ranks of the Trotskyist left opposition, one of whose main leaders he was to become. In Benjamin's work, the pessimistic philosophy of history shows up with particular acuteness in his vision of the future of Europe. Pessimism all along the line, absolutely. Mistrust in the fate of literature, mistrust in the fate of freedom, mistrust in the fate of European humanity, but three times mistrust in all reconciliation between classes, between nations, between individuals, and unlimited trust only in I.G. Farben and the peaceful perfecting of the Air Force. This critical vision enabled Benjamin to foresee intuitively, but with a strange acuity, the catastrophes awaiting Europe, perfectly summed up in the ironic phrase on unlimited trust. Naturally, even he, the most pessimistic of all, cannot predict the destruction the German Air Force was to wreak on the cities and civilian populations of Europe. That IG, that IG Farben would, barely a dozen years later, distinguish itself by the manufacture of the Zyklon B gas used to rationalize genocide, or that its factories would employ labor from the concentrate, or sorry, from the concentration camps by the tens of thousands. However, uniquely among the Marxist thinkers and leaders of these years, Benjamin had a premonition of the monstrous disasters to which a crisis-ridden industrial bourgeois civilization could give birth. This pessimism manifests itself in Benjamin as it did in Blanky or Peggy, or Pegui, Peg Pegui? and a kind of revolutionary melancholia, which betrays a sense of a recurrence of disaster, the fear of an eternal return of defeats. How is it reconciled with his commitment to the cause of the oppressed? Benjamin's proletarian choice was in no way inspired by any kind of optimism regarding the behavior of the masses, or confidence in the brilliant future of socialism. It is essentially a wager in the Pascalian sense on the possibility of a struggle for emancipation. The 1929 article attests ben to Benjamin's interest in surrealism, which he sees as a modern manifestation of revolutionary romanticism. We might perhaps define the approach common to Benjamin and Andre Breton as a kind of Gothic Marxism, distinct from the dominant verses or version that was metaphysically ma materialistic in tendency and contaminated by the evolutionary ideology of progress.
The adjective gothic has to be understood in its romantic sense. Fascination with enchantment and the marvelous, and also with the enchanted aspects of pre-modern societies and cultures. The English gothic novel of the 18th century and some of the German romantics of the 19th are gothic references one finds at the heart of the work of Breton and Benjamin. The gothic Marxism common, the gothic Marxism common to the two men might be said, then, to be a historical materialism sensitive to the magical dimension of the cultures of the past, to the dark moment of revolt, to the lightning flash that rends the heavens of revolutionary action. Gothic is also to be taken in the literal sense of positive reference to certain key moments in secular medieval culture. It is no accident that both Breton and Benjamin admire the courtly love of the Middle Ages in Provence, which in the eyes of the latter represents one of the purest manifestations of profane illumination. For a brief experimental period between 1933 and 1935, during the years of the second five-year plan, some of Benjamin's Marxist texts seem close to Soviet productivism and an uncritical adherence to the promises of technological progress. However, even in these years, he had not quite lost his interest in the romantic problematic, as his 1935 article on Bakufin attests. In fact, Benjamin's thinking in this period is quite contradictory. He sometimes shifts very quickly from one extreme to the other, even in a single text, as in the famous essay on the work of art. One finds in these writings both a permanent aspect of his Marxist thinking, the materialist preoccupation, and an experimental tendency to push certain arguments to their ultimate consequences. He seems tempted by a Soviet variant of the ideology of progress, though reinterpreted in his own way. Some Marxist readings of Benjamin's works foreground just these texts that are closer to a classical, if not orthodox, historical materialism. If I take the opposite stance, this is both because of my own interests and philosophical and political options, and on account of the genesis of the 1940 theses, which take their main inspiration from other writings. After 1936, this kind of progressive parenthesis closes again, and Benjamin increasingly reintegrates the romantic moment into his sui gen generis Marxist critique of the capitalist forms of alienation. For example, in his 1936-38 writings on Baudelaire, he takes up again the typically romantic idea suggested in a 1930 essay on E.T.A. Hoffman, of the radical opposition between life and the autom automaton in the context of a Marxist-inspired analysis of the transformation of the proletarian into an automaton. The repetitive, meaningless, mechanical gestures of the worker grappling with the machine, Benjamin refers here to certain passages from Marx's Capital, are similar to the automaton-like gestures of passers-by in the crowd, as described by Poe and Hoffman. Both groups of people as victims of urban industrial civilization no longer know authentic experience, based on the memory of a historical, cultural tradi tradition, but only immediate life, and in particular the chocolateness that produces in them a reactive behavior, akin to that of automata, who have completely liquidated their memory. The romantic protest against capitalist modernity is always made in the name of an idealized past, real or mythical. What is the past that serves as a reference for the Marxist Walter Benjamin in his critique of bourgeois civilization and the illusions of progress? In the theological writings of his youth, there are frequent references to a lost paradise. But in the 1930s, primitive communism comes to play this role as indeed it does for Marx and Engels, who were attentive readers of the romantic anthropology of Maurer and Bakufin, as well as the works of Morgan. The review of Bakufin's work that Benjamin wrote in 1935 is one of the most important keys for understanding his method of constructing a new philosophy of history on the basis of Marxism and Romanticism. He writes that Bakufin's work, drawing on romantic sources, fascinated Marxists and anarchists, 
like Elise Recluse, by its evocation of a communistic society at the dawn of history, rejecting conservative Cleggs and fascist Baumler interpretations, Benjamin stresses that Bakufin had explored to previously unplumbed, unplumbed depths the sources which, through the ages, had fed the libertarian ideal which Recluse espoused. As for Engels and Paul Lefargue, their interest was also attracted by Bakufin's work on matriarchal societies, in which there was apparently a high degree of democracy and civil equality, together with forms of primitive communism that thoroughly overturned the concept of authority. Similar ideas were outlined in his essays on Baudelaire. Benjamin interpreted the vie antérieure evoked by the poet as a reference to a primitive, Edenic age in which authentic experience still existed and in which ritual and festivities allowed for a fusion between the past of the individual and the collective past. Such then is the erfurung that feeds the play of correspondences in Baudelaire's work and inspires his rejection of the modern catastrophe. The important thing is that the correspondences record a concept of experience which includes ritual elements. Only by appropriating these elements was Baudelaire able to fathom the full meaning of the breakdown which he, a modern man, was witnessing. These ritual elements relate to a dis distant past, similar to the societies studied by Bakufin. Correspondences are the data of remembrance, not historical data, but data of prehistory. What makes festive days great and significant is the encounter with an earlier life. Rolf Tiedemann very aptly observes that, for Benjamin, the idea of correspondences is the utopia by which a lost paradise appears projected into the future. It was above all in the various texts of the years 1936 to 40 that Benjamin would develop his vision of history. Dissociating himself more and more radically from the illusions of progress, that retained their hegemonic grip on the German and European left. In a long essay published in 1937 in the, oh boy, Zeitschrift für Sozialforschung, the journal of the Frankfurt School, already exiled to the United States, on the work of the historian and collector Edward F uh, Fuchs, which contains entire passages that foreshadow sometimes word for word the 1940 theses. He attacks social democratic Marxism, a mix of positivism, Darwinian evolutionism, and the cult of progress. In the development of technology, it, positivism, was able to see only the progress of natural science, not the con concomitant regression of society. The energies that technology develops beyond this threshold are destructive. First of all, they advance the technology of war and its propagandistic preparation. Among the most striking examples of this blinkered positivism, he cites the Italian socialist Enrico Ferri, who sought to trace not just the principles, but even, even the tactics of social democracy back to natural laws, and who imputed anarchistic tendencies within the labor movement to deficiencies in the knowledge of geology and biology. Benjamin's objective was to deepen and radicalize the opposition between Marxism and the bourgeois philosophies of history, to sharpen its revolutionary thrust and raise its critical content. It is in this spirit that he trenchantly defines the aim of the Arcades project. It may be considered one of the methodological objectives of this work to demonstrate a historical materialism which has annihilated within itself the idea of progress. Just here, historical materialism has every reason to distinguish itself sharply from bourgeois habits of thought. Such a program did not imply any kind of revisionism, but rather as, as Karl Korch had attempted in his own book, one of Benjamin's principal references, A Return to Marx Himself. Benjamin was aware that this reading of Marxism had its roots in the romantic critique of industrial civilization, but he was convinced that Marx too had taken his inspiration from that source. 
He found support for this heretical interpretation of the origins of Marxism in, in Korch's Karl Marx from 1938. Very correctly, and the point is reminiscent of De Maistre and Bonald, Korch says, so into the theory of the modern labor movement, too, there went an element of that disillusionment, which after the great French Revolution was proclaimed by the first theorists of counter-revolution, and then by the German romantics, in which, thanks to Hegel, strongly influenced Marx. It is clear that Benjamin's Marxism, particularly after the years 1936 to 37, had little in common with the Soviet diamat that Stalin was soon to codify in a chapter of the very official history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The choice of Karl Korch as a philosophical reference, a heterodox Marxist, close to council communism, expelled from the German Communist Party in the 1920s, and radically opposed to the theoretical canons of both social democracy and Stalinist communism is in itself indicative of this dissidence. Another example of his autonomy from Stalinism, not necessarily linked with the question of Romanticism, is his interest in Trotsky. In a letter to Gretel Adorno in 1932, he wrote of the autobiography of the founder of the Red Army that it had been years since he had consumed anything with such breathtaking excitement. And Jean Seltz, who knew him in Ibiza in 1932, reports that he was in favor of a distinctly anti-Stalinistic Marxism and was a great admirer of Trotsky. If during the years 1930 to 35, he seems won over somewhat uncritically to the Soviet model, perhaps as a reaction to the triumph of Hitlerian fascism in Germany, and if at the beginning of the Moscow trials he chiefly showed perplexity, I cannot make head or tail of it, he wrote to Horkheimer on August 31st, 1936. From 1937 to 1938 onwards, he distances himself clearly from the Stalinist variant of communism. A note on Brecht from his period attests to this development partly under the influence of Heinrich Blücher, Hannah Arendt's husband, a supporter of the German communist opposition led by Heinrich Brandler. In that note, he writes of GPU practices and procedures in which the worst elements of the communist party resonate with the most unscrupulous ones of national socialism. Benjamin criticizes Brecht for having in some poems in the <laughs> Lesebuck fur stadtep St oh, fuck. Stedtebowater poetically transfigured the dangerous and momentous errors into which GPU practices have led the workers' movement, and he criticizes his own commentary on this text by Brecht as a pious falsification. In spite of this merciless settling of accounts, which does not hesitate to compare Stalinist police practices with those of the Nazis, he still retains one last hope that the USSR will remain the ally of the anti-fascists. In a letter to Max Horkheimer, dated August 3rd, 1938, he demonstrates the hope with a great many reservations that the Soviet regime, which he openly describes as a personal dictatorship with all its terror, can still be considered, at least for the moment, as the agent of our interests in a future war. He adds that it is a question of an agent that costs the highest price imaginable insofar as it is to be paid for with sacrifices that most particularly erode the interests that are dear to us as producers, an expression which doubtless refers to the emancipation of the workers in socialism. The Molotov-Ribbentrop pact was to deal this last illusion a heavy blow. The theses on the concept of history were composed in this new context. The chapter Fire Alarm in One Way Street is one of Benjamin's most impressive texts, but in a sense his whole work can be regarded as a kind of fire alarm to his contemporaries, a warning bell attempting to draw attention to the imminent dangers threatening them, to the new catastrophes looming on the horizon. The 1940 theses are the dense, compact expression of this approach and this disquiet.